because we have never been taught to understand that the roots of racism that led to the George Floyd situation are the same roots of racism and, and starting with implicit bias that also lead to disparate policies that play out our healthcare system and our housing um, opportunities and a whole range of things that touch our everyday lives. And that's something that, you know, we would hope, a lot of us would hope that with the George Floyd situation and the Black Lives Matter movement that we would finally have a, 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 a moment of reckoning where we all would become better informed and educated about these, situa these, these issues and not to sort of blame or make anybody feel terrible about it, but because we can't change the past, but we certainly can do something about the future and the now. Right. You know, we can certainly say, well, if this is what's going on, let's actually do something to stop this from happening. That's what a lot of us would hope is that, you know, we, we can't erase 400 years of history, but we can certainly change today and tomorrow, right? If we have the will and, and desire to do that. You know, you don't really know who you are or what you are until you put a really big challenge in front of you. Fear is an asset and ally here to help you be magnificent. This crazy, silly, stupid idea to run across the Sahara Desert. You did make it this time, but you said if you didn't make it, you would try again and again. Everybody's connected to nature, connected to music, to their families. And now we're going to build a world that doesn't have racism and war and starving kids. I've kept telling myself, run out and just keep smiling. We're rolling. Stacy. thank you very much for making time again this morning. How are you? I'm doing great. Dean, how are you doing? I'm doing good. So just to refresh people who perhaps did not listen to the first interview that we did a few months ago, which seems like another universe ago. Um, you are the president of the March of Dimes? Yes, I am. And, uh, you do incredible work. We love working with the March of Dimes. And when we recorded our last interview, which was a few months ago, you know, everything was around COVID and bringing the March for Babies to life. And um, we talked a little bit about how implicit bias affects maternal outcomes, particularly in the African-American community. And that was kind of before, you know, recent events have raised everyone's mm -hmm. consciousness about implicit bias and systemic racism and things like that. So right. I thought it would be really great if we could talk a little bit more about implicit bias, share how it, it's, it arises in the work that March of Dimes does, um, because I think that that's, somewhat of a non-threatening context in which to talk about it. And there's so much of going on around us. I think um, sometimes when you, you suggest that someone can be biased, it's like a threatening thing. Like, I don't want to think of myself as biased. But when, yeah. we, when we talk about implicit bias and in the ways that, you know, we were talking about it last time, it's like you start to realize that everyone's got implicit biases. And it's a little bit of a less threatening way to talk about it. So that's, that's one of the reasons I, I wanted to... See if you would talk with us again today. So thank you for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I realized that the last time, I guess when we had our conversation last time, it was in, it was in March. Yeah. So it was before all of the George Floyd. And interestingly, we talked a little bit about implicit bias then, but, and then all of a sudden the world erupted around some of the same issues. So yeah. So, yeah. so interesting. can you, maybe to, I've looked on your website I've read like you've got implicit bias training and doing a lot mm -hmm. of great work on stigma but just to like kind of start us off what is implicit bias and how right. is it different from explicit bias yes so and there are a lot of people that are even uh that really study this I <laughs> have PhDs in it and so I don't even want to um represent that I'm some sort of scholarly uh, expert in all of this. Um, although, um, you know, I have been uh, working in around these issues of equity and in bias for a long time. I used to be chief diversity officer for a Fortune 100 company and, um, and um, have spearheaded and led diversity and inclusion efforts in 
a variety of, of organizations. So I've gotten to know the issue pretty well and understand how it sort of plays out. So the one thing about implicit bias is that it's implicit and it's important to understand that portion of the term because a lot of people just hear bias and automatically react to that word as opposed to understanding what we're talking about is implicit bias, meaning it's unconscious. It may be bias that you're not even aware of. It's bias that you have that is not intentional. It's um, It really is this idea that there are attitudes and there are stereotypes or thoughts that we hold even unconsciously that affect though our understanding of situations, our actions or reactions to situations um, and sometimes our decisions, and they are personal. And I think the one thing about implicit bias is that all of us have it. I have it. Um, I'm a, as an African American person, I have my own implicit biases. Um, Jean, you've got them. We all have them. So when we talk about implicit bias, it's not intended to be sort of an accusatory, to, uh, you know, thing. It's it's really um, it's really an idea that all of us, you know, through our life have been shaped to think a certain kind of way. Um, and, and the issue that we have, especially as it relates to our work at the March of Dimes around maternal and infant care is, we all need to understand that we have them, accept that we have them. Um, but what we do at the March of Dimes is we try to actually help people see what, what those implicit biases may be because to the extent that implicit bias stands in the way if you're a healthcare provider providing the highest quality, most responsive, most respectful, high quality care that you can provide to any, any woman or any baby, we need to deal with that because we don't want anything to interfere with the level of high quality care being delivered to a woman, uh, especially a woman who may be in need, right? So, um, so that's really what, that's really how we think about it. And that's kind of how it comes into play with res respect to our work at the March of Dimes. So how does implicit bias or implicit biases affect the level of health care that a woman may receive? So I, I think it's important to understand that implicit bias um, kind of plays out in a couple different ways. One is that Implicit bias is a very personal thing, so it, it may play out in terms of how um, people interact with each other, how a doctor or a nurse may interact with uh, a patient. Uh, and it's also important to understand that implicit biases really influence um, how sometimes our institutions act out or put in place or enact policies that then uh, really have the effect of hurting or disadvantaging, you know, a group of people. So I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so we, we, we have a number of examples of, of women in the healthcare system, black women who are pregnant, who've expressed um, that they feel that they are not listened to or heard by the healthcare system, who feel that when they talk to doctors or when they present, um, even this, these are women who may be highly, ed black women who may, or brown women who may be highly educated with access to resources, access to great healthcare, still may feel like they're being judged um, as not being, you know, able to understand their situation. They not, may not be, they may be talked to in a way that's not commensurate with their level of education you know, because there are a set of assumptions that sometimes healthcare providers may have. And these are, these are um, the experiences that many, many women, not just a one-off, these are, this is the experience of many, many black and brown women who expressed that they feel that, that some, in many cases, in some cases, healthcare providers or institutions do not respond, respect, hear the concerns, the issues that they may be raising. Um, and uh, there's an example that we have of, um, uh, you know, many women 
who've lost their lives or come close to losing their lives because of pregnancy and childbirth who often feel that this has been their situation. And we have their advocates who speak to that. Um, Charles Johnson, for example, uh, who had his, uh, who, whose wife um, died after having their second child, after Charles repeatedly tried to advocate for Kira, uh, who, you know, was um, showing um, blood in her catheter after having delivered their baby, um, was promised a, a CAT scan, never got um, the CT scan uh, for many, many hours, um, was told, Charles was told that, you know, his wife was not a priority. Um, you know, in many cases, he felt really ignored by the system and and definitely felt as if, as if he, you know, were not an African-American man and Kira were not an African-American woman, that they would not have received that kind of treatment. Uh, another story, Amber Rose um, uh, Isaac, who is a 26-year-old Black woman who uh, went in for a C-section in a hospital in the Bronx, New York. Um, and even her partner reflected that, you know, all throughout her pregnancy, uh, they felt, you know, kind of riddled with, in, in his own words, riddled with neglect by rude and unprofessional staff at the hospital where they, uh, where they were. And where Amber's, uh, you know, symptoms were really ignored and it eventually led to her death. So, so how it plays out in terms of implicit biases um, is uh, ignoring, seeing a person of color often and ignoring them or not seeing them as fully human and, in, and having the same needs as other women. Um, you know, there are other situations in medicine outside of maternal and infant health where black people are often not prescribed pain medicine as much. And, they, and it's a holdover from a time, you know, centuries ago when white people felt that black people didn't experience pain in the same way. And that was sort of a justification for the brutality of slavery. And the idea that black people still do not experience pain in the way that white people do is sort of an implicit bias that is sort of permeated over many, many generations, right? So that, so that's, you know, that gives you a little example of how it plays out. Now, what it plays out broadly is, you know, you have healthcare policies that don't extend healthcare to poor women and women of color. You have healthcare policies that discriminate against immigrant um, families. Uh, and that often is because of uh, maybe a set of implicit biases by policymakers who don't believe that um, people of color deserve to have health care extended to them. Um, you know, there may be other rationale for why people make those policy decisions. I'm not saying that that's the sole reason, but I am suggesting that we have a history in this country of having implicit bias influence both our personal interactions and the way policies are set as well. Hmm. You covered a lot there, and there's a, a bunch of questions that kind of were coming into my mind as you were going. I didn't want to interrupt. So I want to maybe kind of, um, maybe I'll ask some of the questions, and then you can kind of decide which ones <laughs> make the sense to you answer. You can interrupt me, too. <laughs> In mid-sentence, so, it's okay. Some of the things that you described, to, to me, seem like explicit bias or explicit racism. Like, if I'm, like, a doctor and a woman's, presenting blood in her catheter and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to take care of her because she's black or that's not serious. Like that seems like pretty, like, what's the implicit, what's the unconscious bias there? Or, Cause I could see like me, you know, as a white person, I'm sure that I'm riddled with unconscious biases that mm -hmm. I don't realize. And then, you know, they present themselves, but like, that's, to yeah. Me I can't see, like, I can't imagine, like, seeing blood in someone's catheter and being like, oh, well, if that was a white woman, I'd take care of her, but because she's black, I'm not going to take care of her. So I guess, you know, it probably is hard to distinguish when does the, when does it cross over from implicit bias to full-out racism, right? And to me, it's all a spectrum. It's all kind of, uh, in some ways, um, related to each other. Uh, I don't think, you know, I don't think Charles Johnson heard a doctor or a nurse say to him in the midst of Kira waiting and bleeding internally to death, literally, I don't think he ever heard anyone explicitly say to him, I'm not going to treat your wife because she's a black woman and I don't really want to treat black people. 
I don't think he ever heard that. And that would be very explicit, right? But what, what was clear is that um, there, and, and not just in that situation, but in many situations, that there is impl implicit and unconscious thinking or thoughts that are going on that, that play out and are perceived as racism. Now, this is, where pe this is where people get really upset. And this is why sometimes when you say implicit, if you're implicit bias, you are racist, is because a lot of people, because these thoughts are implicit or unconscious, do not understand that sometimes their thinking can lead to actions that are in fact racist because people don't actually label themselves racist. Most people don't, like most people don't. Mm -hmm. uh, but most people don't understand that sometimes their own implicit biases and sometimes, again, we do training to help people uncover what these are because unless you know what your implicit biases are, you may not even know that some of your actions and reactions could be in fact um, result in, in a racist kind of action. Was or, there, was there yeah. like a, an analysis done after the fact about her to understand why he or she didn't like maybe talk with, I don't know if the doctor was a man or a woman, but to, to talk with them about what their thought process was and why they didn't treat her and, you know, was well, there it's that I don't know, I can't really speak for the, any individual situation, but I can tell you right now that there are lots of healthcare providers and hospitals who are beginning to look at their own policies and practicing practices and look at the disparities that exist of even why highly educated, you know, women of color with all the right income, not that that should justify any better treatment for healthcare. I mean, everyone should be treated the same. We're all humans. But why is it that even um, women of color with education and income and access to care and all the resources they could possibly need end up still getting worse outcomes and worse responses from the healthcare system than even un uneducated white women? And so a lot of hospitals and healthcare providers are starting to look more systemically at their results and saying, there's no other reason why these black women who have insurance, who are informed, who are doing all the right things with respect to pregnancy, who are following all the right results are still getting worse outcomes. There's no reason for it other than possibly let's look at the care and the treatment they're being provided. And when you listen to black women talk about how they often feel disrespected, disregarded, not listened, not heard, that, that is some of the evidence that says I mean, it's not necessarily evidence that is, um, you know, as quantifiable as a lot of us would want, but it is the kind of anecdotal evidence that says, if this is what we're experiencing in terms of the data, if this is what we're hearing from women in terms of their experience, we're obligated to sort of look and say, what is going on with the way um, we are delivering care? And are we delivering care in the most respectful, most humane way to all women, irrespective of race and ethnicity? And that's kind of where we are. And, and, and you know, look, we, we don't, Gene, we got to understand in this country, we don't understand our history well enough to, to know that this isn't just being thought of out of thin air. You know, we have a history in this country of, of racist actions against women of color. We have a history of, of gynecology in this country where uh, white gynecologists experimented without anesthesia on black women in order to, quote unquote, advance the science uh, uh, of medical uh, research and science. We, we know this to be true. Um, we know that to experiment on women without their consent, with no anesthesia, is inhumane. But we know that was done to women of color. So to suggest that somehow racism is not necessary, is not a factor, and that somehow our implicit biases, which then lead to racism and actions that are harmful to others, simply based on their color, we have a history of that in this country. And that is important to understand and acknowledge because even today in 2020, we may not be doing some of those same things that we were doing in the, in the 19th century and the, you know, um, and, uh, and maybe even the 18th century, but we are still, uh, you know, having certain practices and even some policies 
that are not enabling us to eliminate this idea that right now black and black women are three to four times more likely to die as a result of pregnancy and childbirth. And that even the CDC says that 60% of those cases are probably avoidable if we actually listen to women, if we respected uh, their voices of their situation, their symptoms, and actually responded and gave them proper, proper diagnoses and actually responded in a proper way with respect to their health care. That's from the CDC and that's based on their, based on their studies. So it is important that we understand that um, it's not to say, it's not, again, we start from the point of everyone's got implicit bias around something. We have to make sure that implicit bias doesn't stand in the way of quality care. If, if everyone is, even if you're in the healthcare profession, my assumption, our, our assumption is that you want to provide quality care to everyone. Why would you enter the profession if you didn't want to do this? So we know that that is the intent. But we have to understand that people, racism is not, is not you're not born with it. You're not born with implicit biases. biases. These are things you learn over the course of your life. So sometimes it takes some unlearning of things in order to be the best healthcare provider we can possibly be. And that speaks, and that's for anyone. Again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, child, think again. Tell them to come on in. I love babies. Love kids. <laughs> Max. <laughs> hey, bud. <laughs> <Ran away. laughs> um, <laughs> so, and if you know, it's he's a, he's going to turn four uh, at the end of August. Oh, and I, I, nice. Like, you know. I remember when it was like when he was born. I feel so fortunate that by the time I was ready to go to the hospital, it was like, you know, 4.30 or 5 in the morning. So when we went there, like, we were the only ones there at that time. There wasn't a rush. It wasn't crowded. We had our own room. It was, you know, there was a doctor and two nurses. And uh, it was, we had all the best care. And I don't think that, I, I can't imagine that if, and also my wife's very strong, like, I don't think she, like, complains too much about anything but like whenever she was in pain they were attentive to her and I can't imagine that like if she did say that she was in pain or did say that she was experiencing something that they wouldn't have been attentive to her so I can't I just really can't imagine what that must be like for a woman of color or any woman to say like that they're in pain and not have the doctors be responsive to that but I can also say that, that we were fortunate that we delivered at Mount Sinai in New York. And it's like one of the best hospitals in the world and that, you know, just a few miles from here and the Queens or Bronx, they're not as lucky, right? So the hospitals right. aren't as well staffed and the doctors yeah. are busy. And, you know, an understaffed hospital, under-resourced hospital and the doctors yeah. really, busy, and the doctors like, oh, they, you know, they missed that it brought in the catheter. And that kind of gets more into like systemic racism that why is that hospital understaffed? So like, where's the, where's the line between implicit bias and like systemic yeah. or cultural bias? Well, it, it's important to go back and look at the history of this country and why, for example, as compared to other industrialized countries, we don't have universal health care. Um, and if you look at the history, you'll find that a lot of the issues around extending health care to all people really came um, when um, the issue was around providing health care to um, freed, um, formerly enslaved people. And over time, the bias around whether or not even Black people in this country should be provided health care became a defining issue with respect to why we don't have universal health care for everyone. I mean, the 1619 Project did an amazing job of mm -hmm. looking at the history of why we don't have universal health care in this country in one of their podcasts and one of their um, reviews of the, of the 1619 Project, which is a review, which if you haven't, if someone hasn't listened to that whole series or read it, I would strongly encourage it and how the uh, American Medical Association actively lobbied against universal health care. And it came out of the... Um, an idea that, which ended up being a racist thing, but it's probably stemmed from this idea that black people weren't deserving of healthcare. Um, so, you know, when, so you have to understand that in order to, a lot of these issues that we deal with today, Jean, um, are rooted in the very history of this country. 
you know, one of the ways to justify enslaving people is to think of people as not being even fully human, right? Mm -hmm. And when you think of people as not fully human and that becomes embedded into your way of thinking, it starts to play out generation over generation in extraordinary ways. It starts to play out in the way our policies are structured. You know, so get out of healthcare. I used to be in affordable housing. Where does redlining come from? Redlining comes from an idea that black people should not be allowed to buy or live in certain communities and only white people should be able to live in certain communities. That if black people buy into certain communities, it will diminish the house values of the white people's you know, homes. So redlining becomes a policy, but it is embedded and, it, and it's deeply entrenched in this idea that people hold on to a certain bias. Some people have a bias that has been, that they've learned from the very beginning of their lives. They don't even rem remember when they started learning about it. But when you look at when, when uh, kids start learning about the issues of race or how other people are different, how their parents talk to them, how their parents teach them about people that look different or that are different, starts to train the brain that somehow people are better than others, that your privilege is an advantage and other people don't have that advantage. And that's somehow their fault that they don't have that advantage that you have. I mean, there are all these things that play out. And I think, I think what a lot of um, people don't realize in this country, especially a lot of white people, they struggle with this idea of implicit bias because they don't even remember where it came from. Uh, and not that, not that anyone's parents were trying to be bad. It's just that their parents before them and their parents before them and their parents before them probably carried a narrative about people of color, about poor people, about whomever, right? And that has now shaped our thinking. And uh, the issue of race and in this country is one that this country's never really dealt with. We don't even teach about the issue of slavery. Less than 10% of these people even understand that the, that the cause of the Civil War and the root of the Civil War was really around slavery. Less than 10% of the people in this country actually understand that. And to the extent that we don't understand how race has played out as sort of uh, a continuing narrative that has helped to shape, and racism has helped to shape so many of our policies and the way we think in this country is really... Um, why when the George Floyd situation happens, people erupt in shock that this could be happening because we have never been taught to understand that the roots of racism that led to the George Floyd situation are the same roots of racism and, and starting with implicit bias that also lead to disparate policies that play out our healthcare system and our housing um, opportunities and a whole range of things that touch our everyday lives. And that's something that, you know, we would hope, a lot of us would hope that with the George Floyd situation and the Black Lives Matter movement, that we would finally have a, a, a moment of reckoning where we all would become better informed and educated about these, situa these, these issues and not to sort of blame or make anybody feel terrible about it, but because we can't change the past, but we certainly can do something about the future and the now. Right. You know, we can certainly say, well, if this is what's going on, let's actually do something to stop this from happening. That's what a lot of us would hope is that, you know, we, we can't erase 400 years of history, but we can certainly change today and tomorrow, right? If we have the will and, and desire to do that. So that's, that kind of brings my next question is what, should we be doing about our implicit biases? Like, well, as one a, is, yes. What should we be doing about my implicit biases? What should a doc, my college roommate, who's a, not a gynecologist, but an orthopedic surgeon, and I'm sure he's got implicit biases, what should he be doing about his implicit biases? One, one is know what they are. Go through a training. We offer a training at the March of Dimes and offer it to healthcare providers, uh, and we've, we're getting a ton of interest. Be open to the fact that we all have it. I've taken the implicit bias training as an African American mm -hmm. woman. I have my own. I need to know what they are. You know, if I'm running an organization that's diverse, I need to, I need to acknowledge and recognize what mine are. Be open to the fact that we all have them and be open to understanding how your implicit biases may be impacting if you're a, if you're a doctor or a nurse, 
if you're a front desk receptionist, how your implicit biases may be affecting the kind of care and the treatment and the respect that patients deserve uh, in your office, in your, in your institution, and in, in your organization. So that's the first step. And, you know, again, the March Nimes offers implicit bias training, and we offer to, uh, you know, uh, physician practices. We offer to healthcare systems and hospitals and, um, and anyone in the healthcare field that is uh, interested. And I think once, but one, one training is not sufficient, right? It's really, a, you know, initial training is really around recognizing what those implicit biases are. Then where we've got to get to is how can I adjust my interactions with people or the decisions that I make on behalf of this organization so that I don't allow my implicit biases to play out in terms of outright racism to your point. So that my own implicit biases or the implicit biases that I may share with others that are leading this institution, you know, how can we, oh, hi. <laughs> came in right at an important point. Okay. Well, this, my point, my only point was that we, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a process, right, of acknowledging that I have implicit bias, understanding what they are, and then deciding, so what action should I take um, if my implicit biases have been informing some of my decisions or my interactions? What are the sort of personal interaction changes that I need to make? What are sort of the uh, organizational level or policy level decisions that I could make differently that would allow that bias to not influence outcomes that actually may be hurting people. And we have a lot of, we have a lot of tools and not just the, our implicit bias training. Um, we also have on our website, um, actually, um, another resource called Beyond Labels. It's beyondlabels.marchadimes.org. And it was created to raise aware, awareness of stigma and to work to help eliminate disparity. So we, we have been, we, and we created this website with the support of, um, of, of CDC and others. Um, we also have uh, entered into partnerships with a variety of different uh, insurers and companies and others who, who want to invest in this kind of work and who want to kind of, uh, sort of root out sort of this implicit bias that leads to racism, that leads to disparate income outcomes with respect to health. For example, we just announced this week um, a part a $3 million partnership with the Humana Foundation, um, really focusing on what we call collective impact and getting um, various stakeholders and communities to come together and align around uh, reversing some of the um, barriers that have existed in communities that have led to systemic bias and systemic racism resulting in disparate outcomes for, um, for uh, women and babies of color. So we're excited about the fact that a lot of organizations are waking up to the fact that maybe they've in some way contributed to some of these outcomes and now they're waking up to say, wait, if we've been contributing to them, what can we do to actually reverse them? and actually help serve all communities and all women and babies and, and all people to make sure that we have the best healthcare outcomes for everybody that we can possibly achieve. So what would your, kind of as we get close to wrapping up, what would your call for action be for the people who are listening and maybe walking and running along with us right now? Um, what the best actions I would say is that um, one is that if you're a healthcare provider, please go to marchadoms.org and there's a ton of resources we have or reach out to us. And if you're interested in learning more about implicit bias training or your organization um, or just learning more about stigma, I would definitely um, encourage and uh, we want to welcome that. Uh, you know, there are others that are involved in implicit bias training. Harvard University offers an implicit bias training. There are many different organizations that offer it. What I would say is that um, do some reading um, and, uh, and, and um, you know, I mentioned a couple of resources that have really even helped me in terms of better understanding this. And I would also, and, and in terms of the historical uh, sort of, underpinnings of all of what I'm talking about. The 1619 Project is, is great. There's a woman named Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens who's written about 
um, racism in medicine as it relates to gynecology. She's a, a professor in Nebraska at um, University of Nebraska, and she's amazing. She uh, has written a lot, Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens, about these issues. Uh, there are, if you Google medical racism, you, you'll be surprised at all the scholarly work that's been done looking at this issue. And so I would just encourage people to get become better educated and informed because I'm, I'm finding that a lot of people, um, a lot of what we experience in life with respect to implicit bias and racism, we don't do a very good job of teaching the history of this in, in, our, in our schools. Um, and so it really requires all of us to become better educated and informed. Um, and then to really look deeply at ourselves to say, what role do I play in this? And what role can I play in helping to, you know, improve outcomes for people who may not look like me? Um, and to the extent that I can be a part of the solution as a part of the problem, I think it's a good thing. You know, today is the, um, today and tomorrow is the final funeral um, proceedings for Congressman John Lewis, who was a very good friend of mine. I worked on his campaign, not to be political, but when I was, a, when I was an MBA student, uh, he was my congressman and he had, he had, I'm originally from Atlanta and he uh, had been the congressman from the fifth district of Georgia for a number of years. And, you know, Republicans, Democrats are all coming out to recognize his life, but what his life really represented was, and, and his final words in the New York times today were really telling where he talks about the fact that he gave his life um, to love and respect of others. And he's calling all of us to, t to, you really, uh, embrace that same spirit because he recognized that his life's work, which was amazing and historic, uh, didn't complete the full vision of what I think he had for this country and what I think Dr. King did. And so he's calling on all of us to sort of continue to, to make progress, e even in his, even at the hour of his death. And so, you know, part of what I see, um, uh, as my role at the March Times is, I think about outcomes for all women and all babies. You know, we're not doing very well for any woman or baby in this country. When you look at even white mothers and white babies, our rates of premature birth, our, weight, our rates of maternal mortality are far worse than they should be and far worse than what they are in other industrialized countries. And then when you look at women of color, they're even worse than that. And what I say, what I think about the March of Dimes is that, you know, when we are doing our work, we're trying to target every single woman where they are in every community um, from whatever background, from whatever, whatever ethnicity. And we need everyone's help to make sure that because Jean, to your point, your wife should not have to experience any poor outcomes. And I know that you and your family care about the fact that just like you and your wife, we're able to have healthy babies. I can't imagine anyone here thinks that it's not um, in the spirit of America to deny that kind of opportunity for any woman. Um, that's just not who we are. And uh, it's not who, who I've been raised to be as a person. That's not who I've been raised to be as a, as a citizen of this country. So I think what we do is we come together and we say, if we're not doing as well as we should, we should try to do better should always try to do better. And I think that's what I would want everyone to sort of embrace and uh, try to work on with us at the March Dimes and let's work on it together. Well, I love that. And I love that you brought up John Lewis and it's amazing that you had that relationship with him. How fortunate. Um, yes. You must have some stories, but I do. <laughs> I think about when I think of him and when I think of Dr. King, you know, they didn't, they're not known for sitting down in chairs and talking like we are right now. They're known because they marched. They marched across that bridge. They marched on Washington. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what Charity Miles is about. We're- Exactly. And you are the March of Dimes. <laughs> that's right. We are on- In John Lewis's book of March. <laughs> We're all marching for the right thing, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, we're honored to be marching with you. And um, I want to just thank you again for sharing all of this with us. Thank and you. Our amazing partnership. I know that there's lots more marching to do. Lots more marching to do. Thank you, Jean, for all that you do. 
And so thanks to everyone out there for joining us. Every mile matters. Thanks, Stacey. That's, that's right. Bye-bye. Thank you.